In our previous video, we looked at secured lending in 4th century Athens and considered the various forms of security available to lenders at the time. But now we're going to focus on an actual deal and break down a maritime loan agreement. Welcome to Ancient Classics. If you haven't already, remember to subscribe. Here's a unique document. And when I say unique, I mean it. It's the only loan agreement surviving from classical Athens, or I think ancient Greece for that matter. It's a loan to finance a trading voyage. It is usually dated to the mid-4th century BCE, probably around 351. That's owing to various extraneous legal and political developments referenced therein. I'm going to read it out. Yeah, the whole damn thing. Those of you expecting a multi-hundred page LMA style agreement, well, don't worry, it's quite short. Though notwithstanding that obvious difference, it's brevity. You might be surprised to see just how familiar it seems. Written agreement. Androcles of Sphetus and Nausicrates of Charistus lent to Artemon and Apollodorus the Thessalians 3,000 drachmae in silver from Athens to Mende or Scione and from there to the Bosporus and if they wish from there up the left side so far as the Baristines then back to Athens at a rate of 225 per thousand or if they wish to sail out from the Black Sea to Hieron after the rising of the Dog Star at a rate of 300 per thousand on the security of 3,000 jars of Mendean wine, and Hyblasius will be the captain from either Mende or Scione of a 20 oared ship. Thus, they grant a security interest over these assets, owing no amount of silver to any person secured thereon, nor will they secure any further indebtedness thereon. They shall then convey the wares from the Black Sea back to Athens as their cargo on the same ship. Provided that the cargo arrives safely to Athens, then the borrowers will pay back to the lenders the silver that's owing, pursuant to this agreement, within 20 days of their arrival at Athens. The full amount, minus anything jettisoned, following the unanimous vote of their fellow voyagers to thus jettison it. And also, minus anything that they've paid over to hostile forces, but otherwise everything in full. And also, they shall deliver into the lender's possession and control the collateral intact until they pay the silver that is owed pursuant to this agreement. And if they fail to pay it back by the agreed time, then the lenders will be permitted to rehypothecate the collateral or even sell it at its market value. And if there's any shortfall in the silver from that which is owed to the lenders pursuant to this agreement, then the lenders jointly and severally have a claim against Artemon and Apollodorus on all of their assets, whether at land or sea, wherever they happen to be, as if a legal judgment had been made that they are defaulting debtors. But conversely, if they don't venture forth, but remain into the Hellespont for 10 days after the rising of the Dog Star, and offload the cargo in a place where there are no sanctions against the Athenians, and then sail back down to Athens, then they'll pay interest at the rate specified in writing in the agreement last year. And if the ship is totally wrecked, but the cargo is safe, then the creditors together have a joint claim over what's left over. Nothing shall prevail over the contents of this written agreement. Witnesses. For me and of Piraeus, Cephisodotus the Boeotian, and Heliodorus of Pythos. Perhaps the first questions you'll be asking yourselves are, where did this come from and is it authentic? The loan is quoted in a courtroom speech, one like so many of those referenced in the previous video attributed to the 4th century orator Demosthenes. Views differ as to whether this is an authentic speech of Demosthenes himself or that of another broadly contemporaneous orator or lawyer. I don't think that's especially important for our purposes. Either way, Demosthenes wouldn't have drafted the contract himself. It's quoted, purportedly in full, and it certainly seems complete to me, as evidence in a speech given by Androcles, one of the lenders, litigating over the outcome of the voyage. By the way, in classical Athens, court speeches were usually written by lawyers for their clients to deliver in person. Most of the surviving courtroom speeches from classical Athens include placeholders for readings of the law, witness statements, and written evidence, such as contracts. In almost all cases, the actual law or evidence has been redacted, likely because the speeches were preserved for the sake of the fame and skill of the speechwriters and their value as models of rhetoric and persuasion. So the fact that the quoted contract has been preserved is quite exceptional, and for sure that's led many to doubt its authenticity. Though I think the general view today is that it's probably genuine, and that feels right to me. It's imperfect. It has its ambiguities and lacunae, but nonetheless has the kind of commercial features and legal terms of art that make it seem real to me. Why would some librarian or scholar in a later period want to make it up? And how would they be able to? 
It takes a lot of skill to forge something that is both believable and flawed. But why aren't more contracts from the time available to us? Fine, so they've been mostly redacted from the orator's speeches, but what about, I don't know, stone inscriptions? Well, contracts today as much as then are primarily only of direct concern to the parties there too and to their subsequent counterparties. Uh, if you want to sell something to someone, you might need to persuade them of the authenticity of your claim to the thing you're trying to sell, or in this case, to the source of your funds. But there's generally no need for private contracts to be published for view by the world at large. In the modern age, that's changed somewhat, so you'll often find contracts scheduled to public filings, especially in the US. But public disclosure requirements are generally indicative of regulatory superstructure imposed on top of what are still essentially private arrangements. So whilst paper or papyrus or whatever, copies of these kind of agreements would have been retained by some kind of custodian or depository for future reference, i.e. in the courts, as indeed was this one, they would not have been inscribed on stone and displayed in a public place. Place. Unlike, for example, the Horoi, the boundary stones which preserved as a matter of public record details of the relevant security and other interests which we discussed in the previous video. And note here that the security in question was the ship's cargo, i.e. not something for which a permanent public register could usefully or, or indeed need to be maintained. So all this explains the rarity, more so uniqueness of this particular contract. It's a written contract. Yeah, that might sound so bleeding obvious because uh, I just read it out. But the version that has come down via the manuscripts is not a pricey or composite piece together from witness statements, but a word for word reading of the text itself. Indeed, it is entitled Sungrafe, which comes from Sun, together, and Grafe, written, like it is literally called a written agreement. And it is witnessed by some random guys, Formion. Kephisodotus and Heliodorus. Those formalities, reducing an agreement to a written and witnessed contract, brings us to the legal framework in which the loan agreement was created. Like many city-states back then, the Athenians had established and demarcated a sector, one subject to its own commercial, internationally-minded legal system, the Emporion. We see these kind of areas, physical and legal spaces, within or just near a separate parent jurisdiction today. Take the DIFC, the Dubai International Financial Center. When I say financial center, I don't mean that it's just a fancy sounding building somewhere in Dubai. It's an entire business district with its very own laws, ones especially written to cater for international finance. The Emporion, located round and about the port of Piraeus, was kind of like that back in classical times and has its own system of laws and an infrastructure for the supervision of deals conducted therein, all with a view to fostering, or you could say isolating, international wholesale trade outside and apart from domestic retail business. Although that's not to say it was an entirely liberal market or legal regime. The legal system of the Emporium imposed some rather heavy import and export restrictions, which the speaker refers to in other parts of the speech from which this contract comes. In particular, it was illegal for an Athenian citizen or resident metic to finance a commercial voyage for any purpose other than importing grain and perhaps some other certain specified commodities and importing them into Athens. The contract doesn't mention grain, but we'll come on to that shortly. One could also see the Emporium, and the Piraeus more generally, as constituting not only a physical and legal space apart from Athens proper, but as a separate social, cultural space, and quite apart from the world of the Agora and the high culture of Athens and all that good stuff. Indeed, note that few of the parties to the agreement and the ensuing litigation are actually Athenians, or at least not Athenian citizens. The borrowers, the two brothers Ottoman and Apollodorus, were from Thessalus, and incidentally in the speech itself, the speaker bangs on about how people from Vasilis are all good for nothing fraudsters, but that's fourth century rhetoric for you. Of the lenders themselves, one, Socrates, is from Charistos, although the other, Androcles, is from Sphetos, which is in Attica, just to the southwest of Athens International Airport today. So we can deduce from that that this contract was the product of a set of very particular legal and social circumstances, and that gives a lot of colour to its creation. But what of its actual terms? Like I say, we don't have any other examples of verbatim maritime loan contracts, but we can glean details from discussions in other court speeches, and many of the features of this loan agreement seem to have been relatively standard. 
but how standard? And were the precise terms actually mandated, dictated by law? Indeed, some have argued that there was a specific category of maritime loan and that all such loans were on mandatory and flexible standard terms. I don't think any solid evidence for this has been put forward. Yes, it seems that many of our contracts terms are market standard, but that's kind of how things seem to naturally develop in a reasonably mature market. Once a particular negotiated position gains traction, it soon becomes a norm and it becomes very difficult to negotiate away from it. So standardization of terms to a certain degree seems to be an economic and legal fact of life, a natural consequence in a mature and busy market, but a consequence of market forces rather than law. I'd say, not speaking as any kind of legal scholar or historian, which I'm not, but just as a casual observer, that the fact that our loan agreement sets out so many terms in quite some detail shows that those terms had to be specified and agreed, even if they were market standard. Because otherwise, if they were mandated by law, then apart from some kind of contractual trigger, like this is a maritime loan pursuant to whatever law, then the parties would not need to specify their terms at all, and yet they do. Also, the loan includes a specific term which purports to exclude all others. One could read that as a kind of entire agreement clause, i.e. a clause overriding whatever may or may not have been said or notionally agreed in negotiations in favour of the express terms of the final deal. Or one could construe it as some kind of exclusion clause, specifying that certain otherwise implied rights or obligations do not apply. But all of that would be unnecessary, either redundant or ineffectual, if loans such as these were subject to mandatory terms which were imposed by law. So what are the basic terms? The loan was provided for a specific purpose, the financing of a trading voyage. The borrowers are not the owners of the ship and the loan neither finances the purchase of nor is secured upon the ship itself. The borrowers are to travel first from Athens to Mende or Scione, those two places are very close to each other, both in Chalcidice, a northern peninsula on the way towards Byzantium, i.e. Istanbul. They are probably given a choice between calling into Mende or Scione to allow for weather conditions or whatever. It seems that the borrowers are to acquire the 3,000 wine jars, presumably using the money borrowed under the loan there at their first port of call. From thence they were to board a ship skippered by a guy called Hiblasius. That's the first point of ambiguity. I'm not sure how they are supposed to get to Mendel Scarney in the first place. Perhaps it doesn't matter too much, because until they've reached their first port of call, they don't have any collateral. So whatever happens, the borrowers are liable to repay the debt regardless. We'll come on to that soon, because that kind of sounds counterintuitive. But anyway, it's specified that Herblasius should be the ship's skipper. Perhaps this guy was known personally to the lenders, or by repute, so the lenders knew that the ship, and the cargo, and their collateral would be in safe hands. It also seems that the borrowers and the captain were not the only persons on board, and presumably the ship would have carried other passengers and other cargo. So, on the ship captained by Hiblasius, the borrowers are to sail to and into the Black Sea, or the Euxine Sea, the Euxenos Pontos, as the ancient Greeks called it. This is where things get more confusing still. According to the loan agreement, the borrowers are to sail from Mende or Scione, and then they are supposed to go to a place called Bosporus. Then they have the option to go on to a third port of call, the Baristhenes. So, where exactly are they going? The third port of call, the Baristhenes, is the river Dnieper, or rather its mouth, so roughly somewhere around modern day Odessa, and they are supposed to, quote, take the left hand side when voyaging from their second port of call, Bosporus. And that's why I'm confused. See, when I first read this contract, I assumed that Bosphorus must mean the Bosphorus, the mouth of the Black Sea. That makes perfect sense if they are going to then have an option of following the shore on the left-hand side to Odessa. But according to McDowell's commentary, Bosphorus refers to the region around Crimea. But that makes no sense to me. If they are taking the left-hand route, then surely they'd get to the Borysthenes first, and then could make a decision whether to pass on to Crimea slash Bosporus. Well, either way, their return route to Athens is via Hieron, which is and the Bosporus as we know it, though that's kind of obvious. I mean, how else are they going to get back to Athens? 
But the agreed route is a little more confusing still, because right at the end of the agreement there's this clause which reads, but conversely if they don't venture forth, i.e. into the Black Sea, but remain in the Hellespont for 10 days after the rising of the Dog Star, and offload the cargo in a place where there are no sanctions against the Athenians, and then sail down to Athens, they'll pay the interest rate that was specified in writing the agreement last year. That seems to suggest that the borrowers have a choice to remain in and around the Hellespont without even venturing into the Black Sea. Might be further evidence of the fact that the reference to the Bosporus as the second port of call is indeed the Bosporus as we know and call it, not Crimea. But then again, on further consideration, it feels to me that this clause, the one about staying in the Hellespont, is just a fallback in case, for example, weather conditions don't allow them to take their chosen route into the Black Sea at all. I say that for several reasons. First, it kind of comes as an afterthought at the end of agreement and doesn't seem to be one of the primary purposes of the deal. Secondly, they have to sell the cargo of wine, having only just acquired it in Scione or Mende, which feels a bit pointless. Then there's the stipulation about not putting into port in a place which imposes sanctions on the Athenians. That kind of feels like a fallback to me, because if it was part of a primary plan, then surely they'd be more specific about it rather than just anywhere nearby without sanctions. Fourth, they refer back rather ambiguously to the interest payable on the last year's agreement, which kind of feels to me like they're not really focused on negotiating a deal here, just cross-referring to an old one out of convenience, because, well, it's just a fallback, so nobody's primary negotiated intention. And also, all other aspects of the deal are structured on the basis that on the last leg of the journey, the borrowers will be sailing with the collateral to deliver to the lenders, and none of this fallback provision is consistent with that core plan. But back to the planned voyage in and around the Black Sea. If they acquired the wares, the collateral, back in Kalkidike at their first port of call, then what are they doing moseying around the Black Sea anyway? Presumably they'd sell the wine and acquire something in return. I think most scholars seem to suggest grain uh, at their second or third ports of call. So why doesn't the contract specify so? Perhaps because it was illegal to finance anything other than the import of grain to Athens or certain other commodities, so the fact that they would sell the wine and acquire grain is implied and doesn't need to be specified. The loan carries interest at 225 or 30% depending on the length of the trip and the choices the borrowers make on the way. I don't know how that interest rate is actually applied. Presumably that was set by convention. Most likely it seems it's just calculated by reference to the total principle of 3,000 drachma. The higher percentage is influenced in part by the longer term of the loan and or the increased risk of making a longer voyage to more distant places and perhaps owing also to the time of year too, though I don't know much about prevailing sailing conditions um, that particular time of year, or at all. The principal and interest is repayable within 20 days of returning to Athens, subject to the loss of collateral, which we'll consider shortly. The loan is secured on the cargo of the ship that acquired by the borrowers. Now, as we just discussed, the borrowers were the first to acquire the wine in jars and then exchange that for grain. And it seems that the security interest attaches itself to whatever the cargo may be from time to time. That's actually a really technical legal point, and I don't think we have enough evidence to interrogate quite how that worked, but certainly that seems to be the outcome, or at least the intention. According to the loan agreement, the security arrangement is a hypothecary arrangement. We considered this term in the previous video, if indeed it does indicate a specific kind of security arrangement as opposed to a more generic term. But the form of security is not what's really interesting here, rather it is the repayment terms. But the borrowers won't actually acquire the collateral until their first port of call. So until then, the lenders are effectively unsecured. The collateral is to be delivered into the lender's possession upon the borrower's re-arrival at Athens, so only in the final 20 days of the term. That's kind of inevitable, though of course the lenders would have recourse to the borrower's other assets before and after that time, subject to a set of very specific circumstances which we'll come to presently. According to the terms of the agreement, the borrowers grant a security interest over these assets, owing no amount of silver to any person secured thereon, nor will they secure any further indebtedness thereupon. 
In addition to granting security, this phrase has two additional elements. The first, owing no amount of security to any person secured thereon, indicates that no one has or will have already granted security over the same cargo. And it's a bit awkwardly phrased in Greek as a participle. So it's not clear to me if it's a neutral statement of fact, and if so, why, like who'd be accountable to ensure it's complied with. I would express it as a positive representation of some such if I were drafting this, i.e. the borrowers would be on the hook to make sure that the collateral is subject to no prior security interest. Don't know whether that's sloppy drafting, it could be, or whether this was a convention of how these kinds of reps or conditions were phrased. Perhaps there was a rule of law implying a representation or some such from the borrowers. Then the second element, nor will they secure any further indebtedness upon the collateral. That's clear. That's that's what we would call today a negative pledge. So notwithstanding those uh, slight ambiguities, the borrowers are promising that the lender's rights will be secured on the cargo and that no other lender will have security over it. So the lenders know that if and when they get their hands on the collateral, they'll be able to enforce their rights in the event of default without worrying about competing claims from other lenders. That all makes good sense and it's pretty much how secured lending contracts are drafted today. The most interesting feature of the collateral arrangement, however, is this. Provided that the cargo arrives safely to Athens, then the borrowers will pay back to the lender the silver that's owing pursuant to this agreement within 20 days of their arrival at Athens. The full amount, minus anything jettisoned, following the unanimous vote of their fellow voyagers to thus jettison it, and also minus anything that they've paid over to hostile forces, but otherwise everything in full. So yes, once the borrowers arrive safely back in Athens, they have 20 days to pay back the loan. Simple enough. That gives them time to arrange an on-sale of the cargo to fund their repayment obligation. But what's fascinating is that their repayment obligation is expressed to cover the full amount minus anything jettisoned and also minus anything that they've paid over to hostile forces. So if the collateral, the cargo, is thrown overboard or taken by pirates or whoever, then the borrowers don't have to pay back the debt, or rather the loss suffered from such events is deducted from their repayment obligation. There are certain safeguards, specifically in the event of the jettison of cargo, the borrowers can only deduct amounts from their repayment obligation if the entirety of the crew and passengers, the fellow voyages or sumploi vote in favour of jettisoning the cargo. So what's going on here? On first impressions, this looks like some kind of limited recourse arrangement, where the lenders accept that their only right to repayment of the loan is via the collateral. But that is not what is going on here. Amounts are only deducted from the repayment obligation in those two cases, jettison of cargo following a unanimous vote, or seizure slash destruction by enemies. If the collateral is lost or dissipated for any other reason, the borrowers still have to repay the full amount of the loan. So what's really happening here is that the lenders are agreeing to take on the economic risks relating to an enemy attack or such bad weather conditions as require the cargo to be jettisoned. Losses which would otherwise be suffered by the borrowers. Effectively, the lenders are providing insurance for these specific causes of loss, but not for others. Similar financing terms were quite common until relatively recently. This arrangement is described by some of the classical scholarship that I've read as bottomry or bottomage, but that's actually a misnomer. Rather, the proper legal term is a respondentia or something like that. Bottomry is where the financing relates to the ship itself, i.e. in the case of a loan to purchase a ship, whereby if the ship is wrecked, i.e. the hull, the bottom is destroyed, then the lenders don't have to pay the loan back. Respondentia, however, is where, like here, the financing expressly relates to the cargo, not the ship itself. I don't know, I'm no expert on maritime law or shipping finance, but I understand that both bottomage or bottomry and respondentia have fallen out of use these days, I guess because the modern day insurance market covers these risks more effectively. 
And yes, the modern insurance market's very much developed out of shipping practices. I could be wrong though, and if there are any shipping lawyers out there, let us know in the comments if these kinds of respondentia and bottom rich arrangements are still used today. We read of a very similar arrangement in another Demosthenes speech, number 32. It's pretty hilarious. You see, this happens. In that speech number 32 against Xenothemis, we hear about a couple of alleged fraudster losers, Hegestratus and Xenothemis. They borrow money to purchase cargo and grant security thereover, though they allegedly breach the negative pledge. That's a clause that says you can't borrow more money on the same security. So now that they have borrowed twice the amount of money charged on the same asset unbeknownst to either set of lenders, and at least one of those loans is subject to these kind of respondentia slash quasi insurance arrangements whereby they don't have to pay the money back if the cargo is lost at sea. So yeah, they try to orchestrate a shipwreck. It's really funny actually. Hegestratus is caught trying to bore a hole in the ship's hull while at sea. Obviously, the crew's like, what are you doing, mate? So he runs up to the deck and jumps overboard into a dinghy or something, but he misses, falls into the sea, and drowns. Then ship and cargo make it safely back to port, so the other guy, Xenothemis, has to pay off both loans on his own and with only one load of cargo to finance a double repayment obligation. But that's not what happened in this particular deal. It was the subject of litigation, but for less clownish reasons. We'll come to that later. So, so long as the collateral was not jettisoned or taken by pirates or whoever, the borrowers were on the hook to repay the entire principal borrowed plus interest. If they didn't, then the lenders had the right to enforce their power of sale over the collateral and apply the proceeds to repaying the loan. If following the sale of the collateral, the borrower's debt had not been fully discharged, then the lenders could go after the borrowers and their assets to recover the remainder of what's owed to them. That's exactly what we'd expect. However, the way the loan agreement is expressed in this regard is also quite interesting. If there's any shortfall in silver from that which is owed to the lenders pursuant to this agreement, then the lenders jointly and severally have a claim against Artemo and Apollodorus, i.e. the borrowers, on all their assets, whether on land or sea, wherever they happen to be, as if a legally binding judgment had been made that they are defaulting debtors. The bit about lenders having a joint and several claim it seems a bit strange. Okay, perhaps that's partly my fault for forcing the Greek into something resembling modern legal English. The actual words are kaenia katero ton danesanton kaian foteros, which more literally would translate as in the case of each single or both of the lenders. So that means that either or both of the lenders can take it upon themselves to sue the borrowers or otherwise recover what's due. I guess that's effectively each lender is appointing the other to act as his agent to enforce the debt, presumably so that if the lenders fall out or have different views on how best to enforce the debt, then each knows that the other's not going to hold him back. Usually, though, we see joint and several references in relation to borrowers or other obligors. I, if someone has a claim against two or more people, they can go after them both or just one of them, which is useful if, for example, one of the obligors goes bust or AWOL. But more interesting to me is the phrase, as if a legally binding judgment had been made that they are defaulting debtors. That's interesting. So what exactly does it mean? It could just be a matter of awkward drafting, and my stilted attempt to translate it doesn't help, I'm sure. Or it could be alluding to or rather attempting to deal with a particular legal right or procedure. I'm just speculating. The phrase katapadiken, which I've translated as as if a legally binding judgment had been made, that implies that but for the agreement there would have been a requirement to seek judgment against the borrowers before the debt was held to be enforceable. I don't know, you'd think that would be pretty obvious that they owed the money and that they wouldn't need to establish that liability through some kind of judgment, but perhaps there was some procedure that people had to obtain summary judgment before they took practical steps to enforce debts. Perhaps, for example, if you had obtained a court-sanctioned judgment against a debtor, you could just go seize the assets wherever you might find them, but you couldn't do that without a court order. That makes sense, and similar laws apply today. So perhaps this clause waived that requirement. Indeed, the idea that a borrower could voluntarily agree to switch off or contract out of certain legal protections and safeguards is very common today. But why would anybody agree to give up their legal rights? Well, usually because one can get better terms from a lender if you agree to give up certain rights that would otherwise apply. We've thus far looked at the loan agreement in its legal and general commercial context, but 
otherwise without regard to what subsequently happened, which ultimately is why we read it in a court speech today. Most of the speech considers various other extraneous legal issues, specifically whether and when the estate of a family or deceased debtor would inherit that person's debt. Specifically, the speech is conventionally titled against Lactritos. Lactritos was the brother of the borrower, so most of the speech is about whether he should be liable for his brother's debts, less so about the actual commercial terms of the deal itself. You see, when the borrowers, the brothers, Ottoman and Apollodorus, returned to Attica, they neither repaid the money nor delivered the collateral to the lenders. Apparently, they didn't even dock in the Piraeus, but in an extra-jurisdictional territory known as the Foreign Limen, the Cove of Thieves, a place outside the legal and spatial boundaries of the Piraeus and Emporion, effectively a legal no-man's land. Moreover, the brothers had allegedly breached many of the agreement's terms, including the negative pledge, so the lenders were rightfully annoyed if we can believe the facts as supposedly set out in the speech. Then Artemon died, so the lenders sued the survivor, Polydorus, and joined in the claim their elder brother, Lactritos. Lactritos objected on the grounds that the lenders had no claim against him. He was the borrower's brother, not the borrower, after all. So the court speech that we have is a counter argument explaining why Lactritus was liable for his deceased brother's debt. The argument seems to be based partly on the fact that Lactritus arranged the deal in the first place and gave assurances as to his brother's standing, almost acting like a guarantor, though that's not made explicit in the speech. The key argument seems to be that Lactritus had inherited his deceased brother's assets, so he should be treated as having inherited his liabilities, i.e. the obligation to repay the loan too. Well, so what? Personally, I, I find this loan agreement fascinating for all its imperfections. It feels like the kind of deal you'd see negotiated today. Now, chip away at it and you can see that it is very much a product of its commercial and legal context, one which is particular to the time and place, but then dig just a little bit deeper and we can see that the parties try to deal with those particular challenges in much the same way as one would deal with similar challenges today. I don't know about you, but that's just how I feel about so many things that have come down to us from ancient times. Excuse the cliche, but the past is a foreign country and all that. A different context, different laws, different mores. But still, it's still just humans trying to work their way through human concerns. But what are your thoughts? I'd be interested to know whether you're a classicist who's not familiar with these kind of commercial agreements. How does this change your view into the ancient world? Or perhaps you're a lawyer, especially a maritime finance lawyer or a banker. What are your thoughts on how this deal compares to the kind of things that you might have seen? All the kind of things that you might have expected to have gone on in a different time and place. Either way, let us know in the comments, like and subscribe, and we'll be back in due course.